Praise God. Welcome uh, to lesson one of the uh, Godhead Seminar. Um, a couple of very quick points before we get started so I can redeem all of my time. These lessons are sequential. That means I greatly discourage you from listening or being a part of lesson two without first being a part of lesson one, or being a part of lesson three without being a part of lessons one and two. These are being streamed. They will be online uh, on uh, live stream immediately when we're done. They're automatically archived, and as quickly as possible, they'll be available through our other normal means. Uh, I'm going to say this again. These lessons are sequential. Uh, and there will be things I will cover tonight that I'm not going into tomorrow night, things I will cover tomorrow night and Thursday that I'm not going into tonight. So if you're looking for the whole load in one night, it's not possible. Uh, I have spent weeks sifting through all the studies that I've got just trying to find in the Holy Ghost what the Lord's uh, perfect will is for what is going to be covered. Uh, it's not possible uh, to cover all of that in three nights. So if you will understand that I'm hitting the main points of the principle tonight, tomorrow night, and Thursday night, then you can understand that uh, why this has to be sequentially and why it's like this. Okay. Another thing is I am going to be doing more reading than I normally would be doing. I will let you know that, or it'll be obvious that I'm reading because you're used to me looking at you, and if I got my head down, it's not because I'm napping. I am reading, okay? Uh, but there's some things that uh, I feel like uh, I, I, that have already been given to me, and so I'm going to to cover that. I am teaching. I'm not preaching. So uh, I have notes and I am reading some parts of this. Um, I have a lot of scripture. Uh, those that are on the computer will do their very best to keep up with me. Uh, I cannot wait. Uh, I've got so many scriptures to cover. I don't have the time to wait till it's on the screen. So my hope is that you will come back, listen to this again, and stop, pause it when you're listening to it or watching it, and look up the Scripture for yourself and read the Scripture and not hurry through the Scripture. That's not my purpose tonight. Okay? Father, we commit this time together with you. We submit to you. It is our desire that you will talk to us about yourself. We seek truth, Lord nothing but the truth from your word. And we, you promised that when the spirit of truth was come, you would guide us into all truth. And we claim that promise tonight and believe it in Jesus' name. This lesson is specifically on the I am God. The key word there is not God. The key words are I am the real identifier is I am, not the word God. I am automatically means he's God. There can only be one I am, and therefore whoever the I am is is God. So the word God there is more of a qualifier than it is the actual focal point of those three words. Uh, tomorrow night I expect to be talking about the Logos, and then on Thursday night we will... We will wrap all of this up and try to answer some questions that you have left uh, from this. Uh, what, if, what if we could somehow wipe our minds, hearts, souls completely clear of everything we've ever been told about God? Of every teaching we've ever heard, of everything we've ever read outside of the Bible and start our search over again and confine that search to strictly the Bible. 
What if we could do that? I personally believe that the Lord would be very pleased with that. I believe most of our problems in understanding God and any other doctrine comes from extra-biblical sources. People who are just like us, no matter how qualified they may think they are or you may think they are, who are trying to understand God and the things of God themselves, and so they write books and tell you their opinion. Well, I can't find fault with that because I write books. But the bottom line is, Ultimately, if you want truth, you have to learn to go to the Bible as your only source of truth. I believe with all of my heart that the Bible is the, is the sovereign authority in our lives. I believe the Bible tells us what to think, what to believe, how to act, how to be. And I believe that it, the Lord, through His Word, has the right to use His Word to give us that kind of instruction. Now, not, now, I know not everybody that's a believer gives the Bible that kind of place in their lives. Well, uh, you're in the wrong parking lot tonight because I am probably as overboard on that, if you want to call it overboard, I don't, as anybody I know because I reject everything that is not scriptural and that you can't find in the Bible. I reject it. And uh, if you are okay with stuff that's not in the Bible, uh, we can have a discussion if you're interested. I think I can show you enough scriptures to prove that that position may be okay with you, but it's not okay with God. Okay? So the purpose of this study is to go back to the book. Let's go back to the book and see what it actually says. What does the Scripture actually say? Uh, We're not the only ones that have had this problem understanding some of the things that God has said. Let me just read a little bit. This is a little lengthy reading, but it really brings the the challenge to the fore here. It's John chapter 5, verse 17. This is one of the first significant confrontations that Jesus had with the traditionally religious people of his day. John 5, 17. Uh, And as I read this, it won't take you long to understand the challenges they had trying to look at him from their extra-biblical position because they made it very clear the importance they gave to the traditions of the fathers. Okay, And from the position of giving credence, equal credence to the traditions of the fathers with the Bible, there was no way they could accept the things that Jesus was saying. There was no way they could believe them. There was no way they could understand them. So I'm reading. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh here, the two and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, He'd healed a man on the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, what he seeth the Father do, that for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that they may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whomever whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but he hath committed all judgment unto the Son. They are standing there, and this man is standing in front of them, making claims that he has the rights and the authority of deity, the abilities of deity. The God that they believed in. So supposedly, all these years, even though they believed there was a Messiah coming, they obviously didn't know who, excuse me, who and what he was going to be. Because he's standing there making claims that he is the Jehovah God. Verse 24, uh, no, I'll start with 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but committed all judgment unto the, unto the Son. 
that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that uh, heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me uh, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that shall hear... They that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can hear of my own, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There's another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that you might be saved. He... He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness... The same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness uh, of me and have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for ye hath he hath sent me, for he hath sent, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Now, some were angry, some were baffled, some didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Others thought they did, just like us. But he had one strong admonition of direction of how to fix that. Here it is, verse 39. Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Wow. Wow. What an absolute, positive, direct, clear statement. Not search the theology books. Not go to seminary and read some books written by people a couple of hundred decades ago or decades or a couple of decades or a couple of hundred years ago or a couple of thousand years ago. Search the scriptures. It's also a very telling statement when he makes this. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. You think you know the scriptures. But in Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine, 29, he said to the same people, Jesus answered and said unto him, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. They thought they knew the scriptures, and they thought they had eternal life. But they didn't know the Scriptures, and proof that they didn't know the Scriptures, they didn't really know who and what He was. Because the Scriptures testify of me, He said. Matthew 12, 24, He said the same thing. Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye, do ye not therefore err because ye know not the Scriptures, know the power of God? Knowing theology is not the same thing as knowing the Scriptures. There's a whole lot of doctors of theology today that don't even believe in the Bible. Plus, theologians have a tendency to add to the Word and take away from it, trying to define what it stands for. In addition, they have a habit of inventing non-biblical terminology in order to state their doctrines. If your terminology for any doctrine, including the Godhead, 
If you can't find it in the Bible literally like you're using the terminology, then the the terminology is false and the doctrine that you're defining with that terminology is also false. Oh, praise God. One more time. Terminology that cannot be found in Scripture cannot be used to to define or identify divinely inspired spiritual subjects. Cannot. And if you're willing to use theologically invented words that you can't even find in the Bible, that there no concordance can find those things because they're not in there. If you're willing to use them, then you have to accept the consequences of what that produces in you. False terminology produces false doctrine. And that's the first place to start. Is examining your terminology with Scripture. And it's simple to do. You just use, just think of the commonly used terminology that you have to define God or anybody else, get your concordance out, type that in the search, and see if it comes up. The problem is I've already done that for the same terminology, and it's not in there. So we believe the Bible. I believe the Bible, but I use terminology that's not in the Bible. Poor old God. He just can't get it right. He wants us to understand who he is, but he wouldn't give us the tools to define who he is. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm trying to make a point. I'm not trying to be unkind. Here's the problem. There is a curse on those who add to or take away from the word of God. Deuteronomy 12.32 What things soever I command you observe to do it, thou shalt not add to add uh, thereto, nor diminish from it. Deuteronomy 4 2, ye shall not add unto the word of God which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Proverbs 30 and 6, and thou shalt uh, thou add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Revelation 22 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Now, that's pretty strong language, folks. If you add to or take away from the word, it's a salvation issue. Why? Because adding to or taking away from the word changes the message and the truth of the word. And it's not the act of adding to or taking away from the word specifically that causes a person to be lost. It's the the self-deception and the era that you're fellowshipping with because you've added to or taken away from the word. Hallelujah. Truth is never communicated by unbiblical terminology. Ever. The word of God was given to us to guide us and instruct us. Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are, are the way of life. John 7, 37, the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me a drink. He that believeth on me as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly, the one that believes on me as the Scripture hath said. Because he said, search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So if you believe on me some other way other than the way the Scripture hath said, 
Your faith doesn't work. You may claim to have it, but it doesn't work. That's not me saying that. Jesus said it. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, but the spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And then the Scripture that we all know very well, Matthew 4.4, 4, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Word of God is life. Jesus said in John 66, 663, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Psalms 19, verse 7. This is, this is so, so beautiful. Psalms 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. That verse in the context of the previous verses tells me the way that I can understand my errors and the way that I can be cleansed from my secret faults is the Word of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. And this voice came from heaven, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. More sure word than the voice of God speaking from heaven. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. As light as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter calls that a more sure word of prophecy. And then finally, finally, the next last passage on this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou, he's talking to Timothy. Paul is talking to Timothy through the Holy Ghost. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast, heard, hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture. Not anybody's opinion. Not any church's doctrine or dogma. Not any preacher's opinion. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That doesn't mean flawless. That means fully equipped, brought to a place of of spiritual maturity by the Word, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And of course, I've already quoted the verse, but we're not, we're not to read and study the Bible by ourselves. It is the only book in existence that every time you read it, you can sit down with the author while you're reading. It's the only book in existence. And if you're reading it without his, him present, <laughs> if you trust what you're understanding, God have mercy on you. God have mercy on you. John 16, 12. I have, I have yet many, Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot hear, bear them now. Listen to this now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. How's he going to do that? 
for he shall not speak of himself. So the Holy Ghost can't talk for himself? Not according to this. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. I've got a lot more stuff to tell you, but I can't because you're not able to receive it right now. But the the comforter, which is my spirit, he said in another place, I'll show you tomorrow or Thursday. Uh, The comforter, when he comes, he's going to guide you in all truth, but he's not going to talk for himself. He's going to hear whatever I've got to say, and he's going to tell you what I've got to say. Hmm. And he will guide you into all truth. I, uh, I want to share something with you. Uh, on the, early in the morning on March the 27th, I woke up and I was in prayer. And I heard this word, seminal scriptures. I went, seminal scriptures. I don't, I don't even know what that word means. And it's not in my vocabulary. But I heard it. So I looked up the word seminal, and it means of essential importance, specifically basic, central, or principal, crucial, critical, or pivotal. We call something seminal when it is so original, so groundbreaking, and awesome that it will influence everything that comes after it. And I wrote this down because the Holy Ghost dictated this. I read this, it doesn't even sound like me. This is not the way I talk, this is not the way I think, but I can write what I hear. Seminal scriptures are those which contain such a definitive statement of principle as to affect all efforts to accurately interpret the scripture on a specific subject that they cannot be ignored without jeopardizing the faithfulness of the interpretation. I'm going to read it one more time because it's critical. Seminal scriptures are those which contain such a definitive statement of principle as to affect all efforts to accurately interpret the scriptures on a specific subject that they cannot be ignored without jeopardizing the faithfulness of the the interpretation. All scriptures given by inspiration of God, however, on any particular biblical subject or topic... There are verses that are pivotal to the revelation or understanding of that particular subject. And if we ignore those particular verses that are the keys that unlock the door of understanding, God only knows what we'll come up with as a doctrine simply because we ignore the seminal verses. Now, I've taught in the past primary and secondary verses, and I defined them this way. This was my way of putting it, not something as intelligent as seminal. (laughs) So I was below this by a long ways. A primary verse was one that directly addressed whatever subject you were studying. A secondary verse was one that indirectly addressed the same subject. And you don't build doctrines off of secondary verses. You build them off of, or you come to understanding doctrine off of primary verses. And when you have the correct or true biblical interpretation of the primary verses, all secondary verses will harmonize with it. So I call them primary verses. The Holy Ghost, to me, call them seminal verses. That's not a doctrine. It's, you know, it's just... It's just his way of making the point to me. uh, They're very important. Don't ignore them. These verses are not more important than any other scripture, but they address that specific topic more directly or clearly while providing defined principles of interpreting the more obscure passages on that subject. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God. (laughs) I can't find out how to be saved in the New Testament, reading Genesis. There are hints 
in Genesis about New Testament salvation, but they're barely hints. They're foundational stuff, but there's no, you don't know what the house is supposed to look like. That's why the Lord says this. Uh, well, let me add one more paragraph to read that I was given. Inaccurate interpretations of Scripture are often a result of basing a teaching or doctrine on the obscure verses while ignoring the seminal verses that clearly, plainly, and specifically address that topic. So in these three nights, we're going to focus on, because of time, on the primary verses, on the ones that are the most obvious dealing with the subject. And uh, I would love to have the time to deal with all the obscure. I, I love that. I, I love finding the key that makes all of that fit into place. But you don't have the time and neither do I. Okay. Isaiah thirty four sixteen. the Lord says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fall, fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath garnered, gathered them. I don't need to interpret the Scripture. I need to find the mate of that Scripture in Scripture that unlocks the meaning of that verse. When I read a Scripture, and all I do is read that Scripture, and then I try to figure out what does that mean, and I come up with some kind of opinion of what that means. I'm doing myself and anybody I talk to a disservice. Because the only way to know what that verse means is to search the Scripture and find the Scripture where God tells what that verse means. And none shall want her mate. Every verse, every principle in the Scripture has other Scriptures that will unlock that, the understanding of that principle. And if I don't look for those verses, and I don't give credence to those verses, and I'm just repeating what I've been traditionally told and did a little bit of reading and said, well, it sounds like that's what it says. I'm doing myself a disservice. No offense. <laughs> I love God, and I'm in the ministry and appreciate the ministry. But like the Brians, I don't trust anybody until I check what they've said in the book. And if I can't find what they said in the book, they may be nice people, but I'm not believing them or following them. Because the, Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind. What is that? People who just swallow what they're told without going to the book for themselves. Now, some will take my statement there and say it's okay to be skeptical and unbelieving. No. No. It is not spiritually noble for you to just decide, well, I don't agree with that. You're in worse shape doing that than you would be if you were just blindly following. But the point is, biblically, you and I are supposed to take what we hear, go back to the book to verify that it's either in there or it's not in there. Not to some theology book, not to some favorite person of ours, not to whomever, but the book. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in, word, in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Praise God. So, what does the Bible actually say about the p possibility of understanding who God is and what he is? Oh, I know. I know the word. We're going to get to it in a minute. The Godhead is a mystery. Hmm. Please don't let anybody know you thought that because I don't want you to be embarrassed here in a minute. First of all, Jeremiah 9.23 says this. Thus saith the Lord. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, 
which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Wait, 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 wait. I thought God, God was incomprehensible and unexplainable. No, there are doctrines about God that are incomprehensible, unexplainable, no, but not God. Because he said, I'm, let me read you the Amplified on this. Verse, verse 24 from the Amplified. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me personally and practically, directly discerning and recognizing my character. The word glory there in the Hebrew actually means boast. And a couple of translations translate it that way. If you're going to boast about anything, boast about the fact you know and understand me. Biblically, the Godhead is not mysterious. The definition of mysterious is something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. The definition of the Greek word mousterion, which is translated mystery in the King James and other translations, according to Strong's, is from a derivative of the, of the word, Greek word that means to shut the mouth. It means a secret or mystery through the idea of silence opposed by initiation into religious rites. Thayer says it means a hidden or secret thing, a hidden purpose or counsel. The Greek word has nothing to do with the idea of incomprehensible and unexplainable. So, it is intellectually and spiritually dishonest to use the English word mystery as the basis for describing the Godhead as mysterious, meaning incomprehensible and unexplainable, etc., in order to cover the fact that one's understanding of God and the Godhead is not scriptural. The Greek word mousterion has no such meaning as mysterious. You know, I I stand here and make statements like this. Today, it's really easy to verify whether or not I'm telling the truth. If you've got even the most rudimentary or elementary uh, Bible software program or app on your phone, one that gives the definitions, it's easy to check it. I don't fear you checking it because I already did. God is not a mystery. He is a secret that he hides from those whose hearts are not open to him. If you're willing to accept something less than the truth of the Bible, I'm not talking about a church, a doctrine, a dogma, a religion. I'm talking about the Bible. If you're willing to accept something less than what the Bible says, that's between you and God, but I'm not willing to accept that. In fact, listen to the way the Greek word mousturian is used when describing what God is giving his people by revelation. I'm reading, it's a little bit long again, Ephesians 3, 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me you, to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. By revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Revelation means uncovering or revealing. If mystery is incomprehensible, there's no amount of revelation that can uncover it and explain it. How that by revelation you made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. Whereby when you read, you may understand. When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. In other ages, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets... By the Spirit. It used to be hidden. But it's not being hidden anymore. As second, as 1 Corinthians chapter 2 I read a few minutes ago, just a few, few minutes ago, says, you know, the Spirit of God is the one that's revealing to us the truth of the Word of God. We've been given the Spirit so the Spirit can guide us into truth. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to... Skip down here a little bit. No, let me, let me go there. Verse 8. 
Unto me who am, am less than the least of the, all the saints is this given, that I should preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. It was hidden from the foundation of the world. It was hidden all the way up until Bethlehem. And he began to re reveal it then. Finally, Romans 16, 25 says this. Now unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. You don't have to keep incomprehensible secret. You can put incomprehensible out there and nobody can comprehend it because it's incomprehensible. So why do you have, if you're hiding something, it's because it's understood if it's clearly seen. So you hide it. Verse 26, but now it's made manifest that which was hidden from since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of, uh, of, the, of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Here it is. To God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. We're going to talk a little bit more tomorrow about what that means. To God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ. What is, what is the deal with mystery and revelation? God has always used hiding something to control the timing of it. And he used revealing of it to institute it or instigate it. Because if I don't know it and don't understand it, I can't act on it because it's hidden to me. But when he comes along and pulls the cover off, and it, I now see it, and it's taught, I, I receive it, and it's taught to me, and now I understand it. That does something to my faith and takes my faith into a different level. And now I'm going to act differently on that faith. And by having different faith and acting different on that faith, God can then bring about what it was that it wasn't his time for it. How important is it that we know who and what God is? Just for time's sake, I'm skipping this. The first four of the Ten Commandments is about God and our actions toward him. The first four out of ten are just about God. And then he says, Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? In Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. And, and Jesus said, this is the greatest commandment. This is it. Hear, O Israel. The first of all the commandments is not something to do. The first of all the commandments is something to know. The first of all the commandments is not something to do. It's something to know. And believe. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Hebrew says it more like this when in the verses this is quoting. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. In other words, if I don't know who I'm loving, how can I love him with everything? If I don't know who I'm loving, whom I'm loving. Why would, how can I, why would I be willing to give every bit of me to him? And then one of the most misinterpreted verses, 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of 
the Godhead. No, it's not what it says. It's not what it says. Great is the mystery of godliness. And the Greek word there is piety, or Thayer's Greek lexicon says it means reverence, respect, piety toward gods or godliness. So if, if the mystery or the secret of godliness is knowing who I'm serving... I can't be committed to someone I don't know who they are. The mystery is not the Godhead. This is the mystery of piety, of commitment to God, of dedication to God, of true discipleship. It's knowing who you're serving. Knowing Him. We can't faithfully serve a God we don't know any better than we can be married to somebody we don't really know. You might endure together, but you're not enjoying the trip if you don't know each other. The problem is sometimes we think, well, I know them too well. No, you don't. If I'm only judging based on what actions I'm experiencing, and I don't have any clue what makes my loved one act like that, I don't know them. Okay, we've only gone 45 minutes <laughs> Now it's time to talk about who God is. And probably one of the most amazing declarations of God anywhere in the Bible took place on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. And what's so amazing about it is it was spoken to a bunch of heathens. Not Jews that believed in the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but people that didn't even have an idea who God was so much that they actually had an altar to cover all the bases that says to the unknown God. Acts 17 verse uh, 16. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, unbelievers, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. And that word superstitious is piety that leads to fear instead of trust. In other words, it is faith that's trying to appease a God you don't know but you're afraid of. Sounds like religion to me. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not with temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood of all, all na- of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and at the term of the times before appointed the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply or by chance they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us for in him we live (laughs) and move and have our being the point is These idols you've got and these altars that you're trying to cover all the bases with because you're afraid of God. You don't know Him nor trust Him. Because you can't can't trust a God you don't know. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven. Not the Father. Not, hey God. My Father who's over everything. How can I trust a father that I don't really know who he is, what he is? Hmm. So Paul, to heathens, lays it out there as plain as it can be. Singular pronouns. He, 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 he. God. He made the world, set all these humans here for his purposes. Here's the the problem we've got. (laughs) 
We're human beings, and like most everything in life, we start with us and work out. And how many of our doctrines start with us and work toward God? How much of our piety starts with us and works toward God? How much of our prayer is trying to convince God to do our will? The Bible doesn't start with us. Here it is. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was out without form of void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the beginning, if you could put that on the screen again. In the beginning, the beginning of God. Hello? The Bible doesn't start with God. What does it start with? The beginning of God bringing everything into existence that's not Him. (laughs) You know what creation is? Everything that's not God. Because He's not created, can't be created. So He brought everything into existence that's not Him. And in the beginning was not only bringing everything else into existence. He began the plan. The plan was activated for the universe, for man, for eternity. All of it was activated in the beginning. In the beginning was God. I I like this from Vine's Expository Greek Dictionary on the word, word created. This verb is of profound theological significance since it has only God as its subject. Only God can create in the sense of implied, B-A-R-A is the Hebrew word. The verb expresses creation out of nothing. An idea seen clearly in passages having to do with creation on a cosmic scale. Well, it's not creation out of nothing. It's creation out of something. Because God is the originator, and it all came out of Him. Everything. But if your whole focus of God is in time and space, it's no wonder you have a hard time trusting God because He's limited as you are. I'll say that one more time. If your God is viewed by you primarily, from the dimensions of time and space, then he's as limited as you are. That's not where God begins. That's not where God begins. Adam, I'm skipping down a little bit here for time's sake. So the ultimate question is, what and who was before the beginning? In the beginning, But what about before the beginning? It's like all of those folks who believe in the Big Bang Theory. (laughs) But they can't answer the two most important questions. Where did the material come from that banged? And who set off the bang? They They neither can nor will go beyond that. Because to go beyond that brings them face to face with God. How do I know that? (laughs) Psalms chapter 90 verse 1. And now in my Bible, here's what actually starts before verse 1. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world. Isn't that redundant? Earth and world? Or maybe in the Hebrew it really should have been earth and universe. As some scholars have opinion, uh, op- opined. <laughs> Before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world. Even... <laughs> Even from everlasting to everlasting. 
thou art, or you are, present tense, God. Now, tell me anybody but God that you can say, before, from everlasting you are, after everlasting you are, and right now, you are. Living Bible says, the last part of that verse means, you are God without beginning or end. New Century Version says, you have always been and you will always be. Bible of Basic English says, before time was and forever, you are God. The complete Jewish Bible says, from eternity past to eternity future, you are God. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, from eternity to eternity, you are God. Now... <laughs> So, so some of us, we have a really big view of God. He fills all time and space. Wow. And the problem with that is, that's the way I defined him for years. Because I did not understand that my whole view of God was from the perspective of man. And what's worse, if you don't get outside of time and inside of time you're trying to figure out all this father-son stuff, what does that mean? You don't have a clue of getting it right. You don't have a chance how to get it right. Because you can only understand the father and the son from outside of time looking in. You can't understand that from inside of time looking out when you don't even know how far out to look. Hmm. Oh, praise God. Here's the problem. Now, there's a couple of you here that are very connected to Judaism, and I don't want to be offensive. Okay, but Genesis 2 and 4 tells us of the generation of creation were performed by YHWH. These are the generations of the heavens, universe, and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the heaven and the earth, the word Lord there is not Jehovah, it's Y-H-W-H, or I don't know how you pronounce the Hebrew letters, but those are four Hebrew letters. This is the first time this word name, this name is used in all the scripture. Genesis 2, 4. There's a problem. It's used as Jehovah. That is an extra biblical name. And I will read you this to prove I'm not making it up. The Complete Word Study Bible Dictionary says, among other places, this word, Y-H-W-H, the word refers to the proper name of the God of Israel, particularly the name by which he revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 6, 2 and 3. The divine name has traditionally not been pronounced primarily out of respect for its sacredness. Well, that and also the fact it's kind of hard to pronounce a word with consonants and no vowels. However, <laughs> until the Renaissance... It was written without vowels in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament being rendered as Y-H-W-H. However, since that time, the vowels of another word, Adonai, have been supplied in hopes of reconstructing the pronunciation. Oh, so you think God lost it somewhere? There's a reason why He only revealed it as Y-H-W-H. Because it wasn't revealed yet. 
Although the exact de- derivation of the name is uncertain, most scholars agree that its primary meaning should be understood in the context of God's existence, namely that He is the I am that I am, the one who was, who is, and will always be, Revelation eleven seventeen. Older translations of the Bible and many newer ones employ the practice of rendering the divine name in capital letters as L-O-R-D, not Jehovah, so as to distinguish it from other Hebrew words. So in, in the King James, when the, the word Adonai is being translated, it's capital L, little O-R-D, in the Old Testament especially. In the new, in, 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 uh, uh, if, if, if it's YHWH that's being translated, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And that's the way the translators let you do this without using an unbiblical name. If God didn't add those letters, if you can't find any place in the book where He said add those letters, then there's a problem adding those letters. Why? <laughs> the problem is we've created a God that we've named with a name that's not the name he claimed. That I am God is the one that introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush. What am I going to tell the people of God what your name is? Tell them, I am that I am. Tell them, I am has sent me, sent you unto them. I am. (laughs) There it is. Everything that's outside of creation is all God and nothing else. And since there is no space outside of creation, and there's no time outside of creation, there's only one way to define or measure God, and that is existence. I am. Now, at 72, I know what the Bible says. I know the clock's ticking. It's just the way it is. But because he's the I am, there's no clock ticking for him. And if I'm in him and he's in me, it doesn't really matter if I'm in this body or not as long as I'm in him. It really doesn't matter. Because he is the self-existent one. There is nothing and nobody That can resist him. And any resistance that seems like it's going on is permitted for a very short time for his own purposes. Some of those purposes is to reveal to yourself your real attitude and spirit toward him. I am that I am. I am that I am. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. This is the last book of the Bible. For I am the Lord, little Capital L, little O-R-D, Adonai. I am the Lord. I change not. Well, of course not. God is unchangeable because change is a function of time, and he's beyond time. Whoever and whatever he is now, he's always been and will always be. He can't be anything different. Because the I am lives in the limitlessness or the infinite, there's no time. Change being a function of time, God cannot change. Everything that he is right now, he has always been and will always be. He cannot increase in knowledge or wisdom. There's nothing more for him to learn. He cannot become more powerful. There's no power available to gain. He cannot become more holy. He is as pure as it's possible to get. He cannot become or have more love because love is defined as Him. Hmm. 
Nehemiah said it this way, chapter 9, verse 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made, the, made heaven, notice this now, and the heaven of heavens. That is a scriptural terminology for the universe. Heaven, with no S, is the atmosphere of earth. Heaven of heavens is the universe. Even thou, even thou art Lord alone. Well, of course he's Lord alone. If I am exists outside of creation, there's no place for anybody else to exist. This is what Solomon, the wise man, said at the dedication of the temple. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I built. Let's all go to God's house. Well, I don't see the ambulances lined up. So I guess we won't be going to God's house today. I'm not trying to be facetious or sarcastic. I'm trying to get you to think. I'm trying to jar you free from the imprisonment of your traditional concepts that are not biblical. Solomon said it. I, the house I built can't contain you because the heaven and the heaven of heavens can't contain you, much less this house I built. Okay, I'm, Bill got a house over here. Okay. You know how amazing it is that we are called the temple of the Holy Ghost? Well, how can that be? Because a couple of translations of Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has put eternity in the heart of men. What does that mean? That means he put a spiritual, from a spiritual perspective, an infinite emptiness in the heart and the soul of every created human being that only he, the infinite one, can fill. So that's why you and I are the only ones possible, individually and collectively, capable of being in the house of God. This building doesn't have, or any other building we call a church, doesn't have eternity put in, built in it. I was a part of building this. I don't know where we put eternity. But I have two sons and seven grandchildren I had some part in down the line. And at their creation, God put within them eternity. An eternal emptiness that only he can fill because that's how we become the temple of the Holy Ghost. And no religion can fill that space. No religion. No kind of religion, no degree of Christianity, religion can fill that space. God by His Spirit and only God by His Spirit can fill that space. All right, I'm winding down now. Huh. There's no way to do this in 20 minutes, but I'll do what I can and we'll go from here. At 4.30 in the morning on April the 7th, which would be last week, I woke up having a dream where I was standing in the pulpit and I was teaching. And I got up and got my iPad out and started writing down what I heard.
Here it is. The only biblical measurement of God is He exists, or I am. Again, to understand who and what God is, we have to begin before the beginning. We must go outside of and beyond time. This is where the I am is. He is the unlimited God. He only fully exists outside of time. He is the self-existent one, the limitless one. And according to Psalms 90, He is from everlasting to everlasting. He has no beginning and no ending. Everything exists in Him. He is in everything, but everything exists in Him. As the Creator, He was here first. He cannot create outside of Himself. He can only create inside of Himself. Nothing can exist outside of the I am. Everything exists inside of the I am. In choosing to call or identify himself as the I am, he chose existence as the only measurable or better yet identifiable parameter to define himself with and by. No other measurement can be used in any way to describe him. Even saying that he fills all time and space is by definition limiting him to time and space. More accurately, time and space only exist in him, and they can have no existence apart from him. Now, I fully understand that you're sitting there listening to this. It will take the Holy Ghost for anybody to receive this because I'm still chewing on this every day. And I don't mean chewing on it to figure it out. The Bible said of Cornelius that there was a memorial built before God by by Cornelius, causing him to send the angel to Peter, etc., etc. The Greek word memorial there, and also used of Mary when she broke the alabaster box over his feet before his death, that Greek word comes from two Greek words that mean to stay in the mind and chew. So, the Word of God is supposed to stay in our minds and spirits and chew on us, not in a negative way, but just be there, just kind of working inside, not laboring to understand, but just letting it work through your mind and spirit. And then God begins to put the pieces together, and all of a sudden one day you go, I see it. I see it. Again, even saying that he fills all time and space is by definition limiting him to time and space. More accurately, time and space only exist in him. And they can have no existence apart from him. Every doctrine of God or the Godhead that originates from within the perspective of time and space is flawed from its inception. Every doctrine of God that originates from within time and space is flawed from the beginning. To understand God, you've got to start from God and work in to time and space. You can't start with man and time and space and work outward to God and understand. That's why I'm barely scratching the surface here, and, and if you know me at all, I have prayed all day long to cast all those scriptures I can't use on God because of time. I really have, honestly. I give it to you, Lord. It's, I make peace with only using the ones that you bring to my mind and spirit and whatever because the book is crammed full of scriptures that verify all this. God can never be accurately identified, described, or understood from within time and space only. 
In fact, doing that, in effect, undeifies him because it denies him his most unique characteristic as God, his limitlessness. Any doctrine of God that does not harmonize with what the Bible says about God both before and after time cannot be true, be a true teaching about God. I know, I understand, you know, it's easy to sit here and go, okay, what does all this have to do with me? <laughs> Honestly, everything if you want to go to heaven. Because to me, the more I know and understand God, the easier it is to be saved. Because the easier it is to trust Him through all of life's difficulties. You know why? Because this too shall pass, but He won't. There's no situation I'm in that's permanent. Only God is permanent. And if I focus on my problems, I'm going to fail, fall, give up, quit. If I focus on the one who's above all of this and is in control of everything, I'm going to make it. But i got to know him to trust him. i got to know him. Rather than viewing God from our perspective, we need to view us or creation from his perspective. That alone is the source of and path to all truth, starting with God first. Everything must begin with God, not us. <laughs> I know that sounds so simple, but uh, how, do, how, how are we doing living that? <laughs> somebody gives a look. Somebody has a tone of voice. And what's the first thing we do? We get all huffy because of that look and tone of voice because it's all about us. If I'm tuned into him, <laughs> that is so irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Okay, so you got a problem, but I'm not letting you make your problem my problem. I'll pray for you, God bless you, but I'm not letting you make your problem my problem. Not, I'm not accepting it. Not accepting it. Care for you, pray for you, do whatever I can to help you. But I'm not taking ownership of your problem, and I'm not internalizing your problem. It's not happening. Why? Because I have a God who's above everything and everything. Nothing spiritual can begin with us without introducing error in, into our faith in God and perverting our relationship with him. Every bit of me first Christianity is a perversion. <laughs> Every bit of me first Christianity is a perversion. That's strong language, Brother Wright. No, it's not. That's really toned down. I'm just, just saying. Every bit of me first Christianity is a perversion. We can neither understand God or his purpose for all of this by viewing him only from within time. Neither himself or his plan can be accurately understood until viewed first and foremost from outside of the limitations and confinements of time and space. In summary, creation and the creative perspective cannot define God. It can testify of God. It can't define God. God and him alone defines creation. All of it. Creation doesn't define God. It can testify of God, but it can't define God. Why? Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my word's not going to pass away. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. My word's not going to pass away. You know the thing about time? In human perspective, nothing stays the same. Everything changes. Yeah. 
Nothing stays the same. Everything changes. The only unchangeable element in all of this is God. Unless you make him a part of your universe and then he's subject to change with you. This is God. He's the infinite God. That word is in the King James once or twice, but it's in several other translations more frequently where it's, the translators considered it a more accurate translation of a word. The word universe isn't technically, if I remember correctly, in the King James, but it's in several other translations. Uh, Again, God created the earth and the world. The earth and the world? The earth and the earth. So the question here is this. How did all this come about? And how do we communicate with a God who's outside of time and space? That's exactly the lesson for tomorrow. It is the most brilliant thing. And for me as a finite human being calling it brilliant, <laughs> it's, it's almost insulting to him for me to call it brilliant. I'm saying it's brilliant from the perspective of the human mind and the human ability. But he did something only he could do. He found a way to go from outside of time and space and relate to time and space and still be the I am outside of time and space and yet be God in time and space. The most brilliant thing. The most brilliant thing. And we want to take that, we want to take that, that brilliant plan and whatever you call it, that he devised and brought about, and we want to separate it from him. Make it another God. Not possible. Because anything that is not the I am is not God. <laughs> There's only one God, the I am. And anything that's not the I am is not God. And to any degree that something is not the I am, that much is not God. Because there's only one God, the I am. <laughs> so, how did he? How did he? From out there, as the I am, how did he find a way to be the I am in time and space and still be the I am? How did he do that? Well, here's the verse. We'll start somewhere here tomorrow night. Another beginning. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. John 1-1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Logos was with God. And the Logos was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by the Logos. And there wasn't anything made that He didn't make. Oh, wait a minute. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And there was not anything made that He didn't make. Now, do we have a contradiction? 
Because Genesis 1-1 would lead us to believe accurately that the I am created everything. And John 1-1 tells us the Logos created everything. Here's the secret. The Logos is the I am in time and space. Because it's the only way he can be God. A separate part of God. Some division with God. The only difference between the I am out of time and space and The Logos in time and space is, the Logos is the I am in time and space. Well, is there any Bible for that? Yeah. John 5, 8.58. He said, before Abraham was. I am. Now, how many I am's can there be? The Bible says, I am did it alone, by himself. So therefore, the logos can't be separate from or different from the I am, except that it's the I am in time and space. Because if it's not the I am in time and space, then it's not God and can't be God because there's only one God. The I am. See the point? It really is clear when you start from God and work back to us instead of starting with us and trying somehow to find your way to God and understanding God. Makes all the difference in the world. Hallelujah. (laughs) Yeah, there's a verse that kind of goes along with that. For unto us a child is born. And thus a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Several translators actually put it this way, the Father of Eternity. Now, (laughs) there can only be one Who's the father of eternity? The I am. Father, thank you for this time together with you. Thank you for your word. We acknowledge to you, Father, that intellectually, through our own wisdom and prudence, we cannot understand you. But as you said to Peter, that this, revela- this comes by revelation because it's been hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed unto babes. And we confess, Father, we cannot take any credit for any understanding or any degree of revelation that we have in understanding you. We can't take any credit for that because whatever we have that came from you came from you alone. We've simply received and believed, and we give you thanks for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I let you go, uh, I have decided, because of the impossibility of covering all these scriptures, that when this week is over, all three of my notes, if you will understand they are teaching notes, not explaining notes, they will be made available for you to download and just study. You'll have all the scriptures. Okay? So that won't be till after Thursday night. God bless you. See you tomorrow night. Starting again at 7.30 sharp tomorrow night.